The cover page of One Punch Man Chapter 195, titled Teninto, features an epic shot of Saitama breaking something. A pretty simple one, but these cover pages are always a treat. We find ourselves inside an abandoned building, which is the usual residence of a certain hyper-obsessive ninja. He had a bag of ice on his head after being lodged into the ground by Saitama. Speedo Sound Sonic called out to the few presences he knew were hiding nearby and told them to come out already. Popping in from the ceiling like Genos' hidey hole in Saitama's apartment, the two uninvited guests praised their target's perception. Yet again, it was Gale Wind and Hellfire Flame. Apparently, instead of taking care of Sonic and Flashy Flash at the same time, they now decided to take them down individually. These guys went from being a reasonable threat to the Team Rocket of One Punch Man. They even began the whole prepare for trouble sequence before being knocked over the head. Much to Sonic's surprise, two new faces entered the fray, calling the duo a couple of jokers. Apparently, they were only ordered to observe Sonic and Flash, not engage them. They were sick of the troublemakers going rogue. With the two shinobi detained, they greeted Sonic, who apparently belonged to the 44th ninja class known as the End. This was their first meeting. They were both his seniors from the 42nd class known as Merciless. The first one's name was Violent Force, while the other one's name was Destructive Devastation. Now, I know Gale Wind and Hellfire Flame have become a bit of a joke at this point, but that's mostly because they've continued to face enemies that were well beyond them like Saitama and Flashy Flash. But we can't forget that these two are apparently S-Class criminals and disaster-level dragon monsters. And that's not a combined disaster level like the internet surfers. Individually, they're supposed to be that dangerous. And although their growth is now capped on account of eating monster cells as a power boost, at the very least, I'd like to think that they've maintained their strength due to constant training. So these two new faces must be pretty strong to not only avoid detection like this, but also take them down so swiftly. And I want you to keep that in mind because they are far from the only ones here. Revealing himself to have been hiding on the wall, we'd have rumbling thunder of the 37th class known as Golden which is the same class that Gale Wind and Hellfire are from. And we are about to be here all day. There was insanely mad and chaotic mayhem from the 21st class, Terror. There was Ballistic Bullet from the 9th class, Composed. Murky Darkness from the 35th class, Chosen. Slaughterous Massacre from the 36th class, Bloodstained. Illusory Phantom from the 22nd class, Resolve. Melodic Tune and Hued Color from the 13th class, Blossoming. Vibrating Tremor and Instant Moment from the 19th class, Momentum. Freezing Ice from the 15th class, Sure Win. Empyrean Sky from the 27th class, Combined Power. Shrieking Scream from the 5th class, Potential. Balanced Equilibrium from the 16th class, Stability. Multicolored Rainbow, who forgot to mention his class. And Brawny Muscle from the 40th class, Rigid who ended up being covered up by Sonic thinking to himself that there were way more people here hiding than he thought. Altogether, they were the Heavenly Ninja Party, Teninto, an elite assassination team made up of people who had gone beyond the village's rank of highest ninja, Jonin, and entered the realm of Heavenly Ninja, Tenin, which isn't a historically accurate rank, but it sure does sound cool. Despite the silliness, Sonic had to admit that these guys weren't just talk. Each and every one of them was truly skilled. To interrupt this, Gale Wynn told them to stop hyping themselves up and get off their backs. After that, he mocked the notion of having gone rogue. He questioned if they truly found enjoyment in forming such a large group, all for the sake of revenge on one man, laughing at the notion of them being heavenly ninjas. Violent Force and Destructive Devastation were not happy to hear this disrespect at all. The two troublemakers managed to say that they weren't fit to be Heavenly Ninja before being hurt even more. Sonic took the situation in for a second before speaking up. Their village had strict rules against them socializing with one another, so the idea of them having an alumni organization was hard to believe. Violent Force explained that ever since the Shinobi Village was destroyed, they'd begun to change their previous ways of thinking. They had been gathering and biding their time behind closed doors, all for the sake of preparing for a certain plan. And the time for their reckoning had finally arrived. All because that man has finally awakened. And with his return, the world would be turned upside down. Sonic was shocked to hear this. He knew exactly who they were referring to. And that's because that man was the founder of the ninja village they all hailed from. 
In fact, many have believed him to be the most powerful ninja in history. Apparently, he lost consciousness after an intense fight against Blast 15 years ago and has been knocked out inside a recovery capsule ever since. And I gotta say, getting beat into a 15-year coma doesn't sound very impressive to me, but whatever. With Batman as their leader, they would firstly get rid of their sworn enemy, Flashy Flash. From there, they'd move on to the public execution of the number one S-Class hero, Blast. Lofty ambitions indeed. I really wonder what Flashy Flash could have possibly done to make them all that mad. But with those two dealt with, they were sure that nobody else would be able to oppose them. Or so they think. The Heavenly Ninja Party would tyrannically rule the world thanks to the overwhelming power of their ninjutsu. With all this in mind, they also had a use for Sonic as well. Tomorrow night, they wanted him to call Flashy Flash to this very location. Slaughterous Massacre assured his junior that they wouldn't force him to kill Flash on his own, that they'd be waiting here for him too. If the young ninja failed to comply, they would have no choice but to end his life too. Not to mention, that man would be among them tomorrow as well. And without receiving a response, they took their leave. From there, we returned to Hero Association headquarters. Flashy Flash was shocked by what he heard they were doing live experimentation with the separation of monster cells, and Blast had returned to their dimension specifically to watch the process. He and Sitch wanted to learn the key to undoing human monsterification as swiftly as they possibly could. And if they can actually cure the creatures, that'll kind of mess with Saitama's usual approach. Once something is a monster and openly aggressive, he tends to destroy them without hesitation. He has killed plenty of formerly human monsters. It wasn't him this time, but even just last chapter, we saw a group of internet snowflakes get dusted by Genos and Flashy Flash. The fact that they're only just looking into this sort of thing when monsters have been around forever is kind of suspicious though. But speaking of monsters, Sitch questioned who the little one behind Saitama was. Flashy Flash explained that Saitama and Monaco came into direct contact with God at the same time that he did. So he brought them along with him as precious samples. Hearing him call them precious, Saitama and the little lady exchanged a high five. But with that, it was time for the experiment to commence. Two former humans turned monsters were hooked to a machine and experienced excruciating pain. Watching through the glass, Saitama recognized the two to be from the martial arts tournament he participated in. For the record, their names were Benpatsu and Volton. The woman overseeing the experiment was suddenly in a panic. The numbers weren't stabilizing at all. Their breathing and pulses were going critical. Seeing that the subjects couldn't handle the pain, Sitch quickly told her to shut it down. This is almost like Psychos' experiments that aim to force monsters to break their limiters. The two monster martial artists completely lost consciousness and were foaming from the mouth once it was all over, a sight that thoroughly terrified Monaco. Backing away and hiding behind a table, she shouted to them that she was never a human to begin with, so there was no point in doing that sort of stuff to her. To this, Saitama promised her that they wouldn't, which is to say that even if they wanted to, he wouldn't let them. Clearly, Saitama already likes the little monster more than Fubuki, to the point where he was even curious how she was born in the first place. As it turns out, Monaco is actually a piece of Gyoro Gyoro that got separated during the incubation process, sort of like a little twin or something. That's really interesting. Gyoro Gyoro was more or less just a puppet for Psychos, so for Monaco to possess her own sentience is really something special. Seeing as the larger body was compatible with Esper abilities, maybe Monaco will be able to grow into a bit of power herself. At that point, Tatsumaki and Fubuki would definitely be jealous of Saitama's favorite Esper. The bald hero wondered if Monaco was Gyoro Gyoro's sense of hunger. However, she preferred to believe herself to be its conscience. But to interrupt their banter, Blast noticed something peculiar. It was another martial artist by the name of Hamukichi. Despite the pain, he struggled towards the machine again. From there, he strapped himself in once more and asked them to continue their experiments on him. This astonished everyone watching. With tears flowing down his face, the bear monster stammered out that he knew the kids at the dojo were going to be watching him perform. But then, he and the others were threatened to be killed if they didn't eat monster cells and become mysterious beings. The guy was barely making any money teaching self-defense classes to women and children, so he justified the act with the prospect of freedom. But now that he's a monster, he regrets it with all his heart. He couldn't possibly look his students in the eye as he is now, so he begged them to continue. With a nod, Sish accepted his request, and they kept going. 
Again, it was terribly painful. But much of the woman's shock, the third subject's numbers had actually stabilized. These results were incredibly promising. That made it clear to Blast that a monster's psychological state was the key to success. Again, these are similar concepts to Psychos' experiments towards the removal of a person's limiter. What if the reversion process leads to even greater power or potential? That could be huge for Garo. However, the bear monster could only handle so much and was benched for the time being. But now that the festivities were over, Flashy Flash turned to Blast, intending to follow up on the reason they'd come here in the first place. They were here to talk about God. Flashy Flash was sure that the dimensional hero knew something, particularly about the connection between God and the ninja village he was raised in. And that's the chapter. Definitely a short one this time around, but considering the setup for a fight against the heavenly ninja, that man, and more information on Blast, I'm just gonna hit the copium and choose to believe that Murata decided to give us this chapter as an appetizer because he is cooking up something really special. On that note, the support you guys have been showing for these One Punch Man videos has been really special too, so thank you for all the kind words, they really do mean a lot. As always, I'm Slice Botaku. thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day, I love you!